All right, there we go. So uh, a few little technical glitches like usual. Um, but uh, hi, I'm Mick Schroeder. I'm the Director of Winemaking for Sonoma Catrea. And welcome to our third virtual Sonoma Catrea tasting. Uh, we're coming to you live, uh, this time outside of the tasting room. So it's a just a drop-dead gorgeous day here in Windsor, Northern California. And it's my thrill and honour to, uh, to introduce uh, a couple of fantastic ladies who are going to be talking about equally fantastic wines. Uh, the first one is Cara Morrison. Say hi, Cara. Hello. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so Cara is our Chardonnay winemaker and has been with us since 2005. And she knows Chardonnay, she knows Sonoma Catria like the back of her hand. Just in case you don't know, She's the unheralded great Chardonnay winemaker of California. Um, <laughs> and she really is. You no, know, if you think about the, the quality and the consistency of what we do, especially with Russian River Ranches and Sonoma Coast Chardonnays, Cara is just the amazing lady behind those wines. But her real passion lies in these two single vineyard wines. So I'll let her talk about those in a minute. And then uh, behind me is is Shannon, and Shannon's my counterpart. Shannon uh, looks after all of the viticulture uh, vineyard side. She manages our six estate vineyards and looks after our growers. Um, coincidentally, today, 50 years of Earth Day on this day, uh, 50 years ago. And one of the things we're really proud and thrilled about is both the, the winery and our vineyards, and in fact, most of our growers um, are certified sustainable. And as our new vintages start coming out, you'll start to see the Sonoma County Sustainability, that, that, that <laughs> sustainability logo um, appearing on our label. So, uh, so Shannon does an amazing uh, job. She's the backbone of, of, of what we are and what we do because without great grapes, we can't make great wine. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it to these amazing ladies to take over. Um, hope you enjoy the telecast. Cheers. Well, thank you, Mick. That was wonderful. <laughs> Where'd it go? Oh. <laughs> so um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's so lovely to have you here at Sonoma Cotrera. It's a gorgeous day, a little windy, so you might hear a little bit of noise. But um, that just makes it a little bit more real, right? So um, I just want to say a special welcome to all the Sonoma Couture fans out there. You know, I, when I go out in the marketplace, I talk to people or people talk to me and they say, oh, I've tasted your wine 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and I absolutely love it. I order it all the time. And that's just, it's just so, so wonderful to me. Um, and then I also want to thank all our Club Couture members. Um, and of course, anyone can become a Club Couture member if you go on the website. Um, and then also I want to thank Arcus Golf Group uh, for joining us today. It's really lovely to have you. Um, and a more personal note, I want to thank all my friends and family for joining in, especially my dad out of Arizona. Um, it's especially important because today is April 22nd, which is also his birthday. So happy birthday, dad. Um, so... Moving on to our taste. Oh, I also wanted to say thank you to everybody for coming here. I know it's a an interesting time, and so we're here just to have some fun for a little while and um, enjoy ourselves. And but I do also want to say thank you to all the first responders. I do have a lot of family out there and friends in the medical profession. So um, you know, family out in Louisiana and Ohio, uh, friends in Arizona and old California. Um, thank you guys for working out, um, uh, working in the, you know, healthcare industry right now. So do you have anything you want to add? No, just really looking forward to tasting through these two wines and having the opportunity to talk about um, two of our very unique vineyards um, that get showcased through two of our single vineyard wine. <laughs> So, um, so we're going to be tasting our Le Pierre and our Coutre. These are both single vineyard wines, um, and they're they're very special. We've been making these wines since 1981, um, since our first vintage. Um, we become so they're single vineyard, meaning all the grapes come from a single vineyard, different places. Um, and these two are really fun to taste together because they're so different. Um, and then we're also going to be doing a little bit of a cheese tasting with them. So. 
Um, if you guys didn't see the little note, um, you know, if you guys have any cheese at home, like uh, the blue cheese and goat cheese is what I was tasting with today. But if you have anything in the fridge, a couple different cheeses, it's fun to just try different things with different cheeses with different wines and see how maybe one cheese bears better than the other cheese. So, you know, if you have any of those, that's great. But first of all, to talk about the wines, we have Shannon here, which is perfect because she can talk about these two different vineyards and the concept of terroir. So I'll give this to Shannon. Okay. Do you want to pour some wine while we oh, start oh, going? That's a great idea. Okay. <laughs> um, so again, you know, you've probably heard winemakers talk about terroir, maybe vineyard managers. Um, but what we're tasting today is really a perfect example of it because it's two vineyards that are you know, relatively close. They're both in the Sonoma Coast Appalachian. Um, our Le Pierre Vineyard is about 45 minutes south of us, uh, back towards San Francisco in the Sonoma Valley. And then Coutrere, we're sitting here at Coutrere today, and it's really in the heart of the Russian River Valley. The two wines are completely different, and Kara will talk about that. But a lot of that originates in the vineyards. And when we talk about terroir, we're really talking about the differences in soil, the differences in climate, and even the differences in topography. And at Le Pierre, which is probably one of our most unique vineyards and one of the most unique Chardonnay vineyards, I'd say, in all of California. It's this beautiful rocky soil. It's an ancient river. And as the river kind of meandered, it dropped out these large boulders and large rocks. And so we have this extremely rocky soil. And here you can see it in front of me. It's really, really heavy. <laughs> so these are the rocks that we have in Le Pierre. And the whole vineyard is just covered in these. And if we've, we've dug down 10, 20 feet, and that rock goes straight down. And so that's kind of the conditions we're farming in. And when you have a vineyard with this much rock and gravel content, it doesn't hold any water, it doesn't hold any nutrients, and it really limits the vine growth. Um, on the contrast, when we get into tasting the Coutrere, we're sitting here in an ancient, what we think is an ancient seabed, as we find all of these fossilized seashells throughout Coutrere. And instead of being this real gravelly, rocky soil, we have these loamy soils, even with a little bit of clay as we go down. So we have a little more water holding capacity. We have a little more nutrients. So our vine growth here at Coutrere is different. Um, the two vineyards kind of start the season differently. We at Le Pierre will get bud break three weeks earlier than we see at Coutrere. And again, that's due to these large, large rocks. They as soon as we start getting warm, they soak up the sun, that sun kind of warms the soil, and that signals the vine to kind of wake up for the season, and they start growing. So out at Lake Pierre, we maybe have shoots right now that are 20, 24 inches, and at Coutrere, we're maybe four or five inches. So we're a couple of weeks behind right now. I'll let you kind of get back to the wines and pop in as we go. Okay. Okay. So um, the wine, so I was kind of cheating and smelling while she was talking. <laughs> Um, now, the, the most fun to do with wine is to try it with different foods. Um, you know, probably about 15, 20 years ago, it was a while back, I was at a seminar where a local uh, uh, chef icon, uh, John Ash, was speaking, and he talked about having these pairing epiphanies where you would just taste something and think, oh my gosh, that is so amazing. And, um, and I think it's so much fun to try to find these on your own. Um, and so... I'm going to try to show you some that I had in the past that I was really surprised by. Um, and one pairing, well, first of all, when you smell and taste the lapier, it's very elegant, um, lemon lime, mineral, earthy. Um, it's just a very unique wine. And if you taste it on the palate, you know, it's got a really nice crisp acidity. Um, a touch of oak, but not too much. Um, and it's got kind of an angular or tight mouthfeel with that acidity. Um, so it's really, it's just a very elegant one. I know I've already said that, but I just really think it is. Kara, I have a good question for you as you're starting to yes. taste the Lake Pierre. We have a question from Hannah Feliz, and it says, what does Lake Pierre mean? Does it directly translate to something? <laughs> it does. That's a great question. Uh, Le Pierre means um, the rocks or the pebbles. So the vineyard was just named basically after all the rocks that are in there. And like Chance said, there's just rocks. Every, actually, the rock wall behind her is made out of all the rocks in Le Pierre. It's almost like they we harvest them. <laughs> we do. <laughs> They're everywhere on this property. We've brought up so many. So when you taste this Le Pierre and then you have a little bit of blue cheese, which... 
I'm not sure I'm going to do in front of all of you. <laughs> I did it earlier. Um, but you have a little bit of the blue cheese. It's a really surprising pairing because blue cheese can be very strong. Um, and like this particular blue cheese I have is very strong. Um, and then you, so you have that kind of creamy blue cheese and then you taste the wine, the Le Pierre and the Le Pierre just cuts through all that creaminess, that nice acidity cuts through all that creaminess and it almost dances on your tongue. It is so interesting. And so to me, that was like a pairing epiphany because I, I totally did not think this was going to work when I tried it a few years ago. I thought, no, 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 it's, it's too strong for the wine. It's, it's going to overpower it, but it's actually an amazing combination. Yeah, I would agree. Kara had me taste the two before the tasting, and I, I had that same kind of thought, like, no way. The, the Le Pierre is so acidic or, you know, just has this really nice, long acidity. And then blue cheese is so strong, you'd think they kind of wrestle with each other. And that Le Pierre just cut right through that sharpness of the blue cheese and just created this beautiful harmony. <laughs> it's really great. Yeah. And one thing I love about Le Pierre is it's um, so consistent year after year. I mean, I've tasted Le Pierre um, 20, 30 years old, and it, year, it it's just, it's always got this particular style with this lemon lime. Um, crisp acidity, um, a nice earthy character. So it's just, it's just a really amazing wine. So I hope you guys are trying it. If you don't have a chance, you can order it online. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kara, I'm going to give you another mm -hmm. question. Uh, we have a question from Lawrence of what is the oak regime for the Lake Pierre? Oh, the oak regime. Um, it's all one year old barrels. So new barrels are a bit too strong. Um, so you need to kind of soak up that flavor a little bit the first year with other wines. And then late here, we give it hundred percent one-year-old barrels from a really tight grain front forest in France. So it really gives that, um, goes with that crisp acidity and it's more of a structure barrel, um, and, and to, to complement the wine and not overpower it. Yeah. Great. So, um, Kind of weird not to be able to have the interaction. <laughs> Somebody looking at you saying, "Yes, that makes sense." Um, so, and now it's fun now to contrast this with the Coutre. So, if you could all smell the Coutre. Now, the Coutre has a little bit more newer oak, about twenty-five percent new oak, seventy-five percent one-year-old barrels. So, you get a little bit more of the new oak, but also because the soils are a bit heavier soils, um, we put it with a wider grain French oak. And you can really get the caramel and the nutmeg from the barrels, which is just really beautiful. Um, and then when you taste it, get a creamier, fuller mouthfeel. So these wines are different because the Lapierre is more of that kind of tighter, acidic wine and crisp. And then the Coutre is a little bit bigger, rounder, fuller. So it just depends on what style of wine you like. Um, and I would take that back a little bit, kind of hinting back on the vineyards and that difference in style. So we've talked a little bit about the soils, but also the climate at both. So Coutre sits in the heart of the Russian River Valley, and we get the great fog influence that the Russian River Valley is known for here. So in the afternoons and summertime and the you know height of our growing season, the fog flows in uh, from the ocean and it kind of blankets the vineyard in kind of a late afternoon, early evening, which really cools the temperatures here at Coutre. And at Le Pierre, it's down uh, closer to the San Pablo Bay. It doesn't get the fog influence, but it gets windy. Yet again, it has these large rocks that have warmed up throughout the day. So the site has this microclimate that stays warmer throughout kind of the whole evening and keeps kind of respiring. The vines keep working away. So when we harvest Le Pierre. It's about six weeks earlier than we harvest Chardonnay here at Coutre, um, which is a pretty big difference. It's about the start of our harvest and the end of our harvest. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that really, I think, shows in the wines in that, you know, with Le Pierre, you get this really crisp, preserved acidity um, that comes because the, the grapes ripen, yet that acid level is so high still. And that minerality coming from the vineyard really shines through as well. So now we could try some of this. I, now, if you have some soft goat cheese, um, if you try the soft goat cheese, it's really creamy that goes well with the Couture. So it's kind of a nice comparison, um, but it also contrasts a little bit because it's got a little bit more of that acidity and it's really light and fresh. So when you try the Couture with the, the goat cheese, 
it's just a beautiful pairing because it's contrasting with each other instead of being, you know, too complimentary, too much the same. Um, so hopefully you can all try that at home. <laughs> I would, I really want to try it. <laughs> so Karen, yes. real quick, I've got two good questions. One is asking um, from Florence and Cliff Jackson, whether both wines have undergone malolactic fermentation. Yes. So um, actually all of our Chardonnays um, go under malolactic fermentation. Um, malactic fermentation, just a quick um, sidebar, malactic is when the malic acid, like green apple, is converted into lactic acid, um, which is like creamy yogurt. Um, and so when it does that conversion, there's a little bit of a byproduct of diacetyl, which is butter. Um, so some people get really buttery Chardonnays. Um, and so the really cool thing about Chardonnay and winemaking in general is that you can play with it. So we actually use a malactic that doesn't create much of that buttery side note. It mostly just converts the acids to make it creamier and fuller bodied. Um, and that's what we're really going for. We're not looking for a lot of big butter to cover up the beautiful fruit notes on the wine. So, but yes, all the wines have malactic, long story short. <laughs> Was there another question? There was a question asking you to define regime. I think around oats. When we say oh. regime, that's one of our kind of <laughs> internal terms. So maybe explain what we're talking about there. Oak regime is just kind of our, I guess, our oak plan or how, you know, it's how we tend to do the oak year after year. So we're saying that Lapierre's 100% uh, one year old barrels, and that's our oak regime. That's just kind of the oak, the, the plan that we have. Whether or not the clones are different on the two vineyards. The two. Well, that's actually a good question <laughs> for you, Shannon. Okay. <laughs> um, so again, a question from Florence and Cliff Jackson. We have multiple clones planted across all of our vineyards, all six of our vineyards. Um, so here on Coutrere, we have the same clones planted that we have at Lake Pierre. And typically these wines may be a blend of a couple blocks, right? So mm -hmm. they're quite likely a blend of clones, maybe all the different clones, the Dijon clones, um, clone four, some other small clones. So really the clonal difference isn't what's standing out here. Yes, it's, it's a pretty much all vineyard. That's different. So, so you know, one thing we kind of miss doing, Shannon, is just talking about how we got into the wine industry or Sonoma Couture. Yeah. You want to do that? Yeah. Here we go first. Yeah, you go first. Um, I've been with Sonoma Trayer for going on 12 years. Um, been in the wine industry for almost 20 years now. I was actually born and raised right here in Sonoma County, um, just a couple miles away from the winery. Never imagined that I'd get into the wine industry. Wasn't really even aware the wine industry existed as I was growing up. I went away to college. I just happened to end up at UC Davis studying genetics. I um, still had no idea of the wine industry that even existed in my hometown until I took a general education course in viticulture and enology. And, you know, Kara spoke to epiphanies before, a food epiphany. It was an epiphany or an aha moment to me is, okay, I love science and I like wine. And this is a really great, you know, meld of two different areas that I could bring together and have a career and um, really make something or be a part of something that brings joy to people. And I changed my major then and continued at Davis and ended up here. Um, I came to Sonoma Couture. When I saw the opportunity, I jumped at it. Um, wasn't hard to think about to come to, you know, one of the greatest wineries and most well-known brands um, in the wine industry and kind of back in my hometown. How about you, Kara? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I kind of fell into it as well. I was going to UC Davis, uh, which is a wonderful school. And um, I was a science major and just found, found the winemaking major. So that was that was really lucky for me. Um, and how I found Sonoma Couture, I was uh, a young winemaker in 1999 when I first tried Sonoma Couture. So, and I just absolutely loved the Chardonnay. I thought this is the type of wine and the style of Chardonnay I want to make. And um, five years later in 2005, I became the assistant winemaker here making Chardonnay. Um, and I've been here for um, 15 years and I absolutely love it. It's just a privilege to make this wine and a wine that so many of you guys enjoy. It's just, it's really special to do. So thank you. Thank you everybody for that. 
So here we have another question for you um, from, oh, no, Nick, but it says, I'm curious, <laughs> besides cheese, what food do you think pairs best with each of these ones? Oh, great question. Um, I think now I was doing big contrasts with the cheese, whereas the blue cheese of Le Pierre, that was kind of strong. And then the kind of the goat cheese with the, the, the trer. And if you pair, I, I would go the opposite where I would do the same where, you know, the Le Pierre with a uh, lemon sauce versus seafood, you know, scallops and lemon sauce or something is really fabulous. And then um, for the Couture, it's a little bit bigger wine. So it, like a creamier sauce, like an Alfredo, um, you know, like a, a creamy chicken or something like that is for the Couture. So that it's sometimes it's not just the food, it's the sauces that really make, make or break the food. <laughs> So we're flaring up Shan's allergies Sorry. out here with the wind. Yes, it's breezy <laughs> and it, everything is in bloom right now. Um, so we had another question a little bit ago asking about um, harvest timing and whether we pick the grapes in the day or in the night and if they go through the cooling tunnels. So we pick um, our vineyards entirely by night. Typically our crews are starting around one or two in the morning. Um, and we've been doing this for as long as I've been here, when I started about 12 years ago, mm -hmm. I got half the crews picked during the night and half picked during the day. And we've slowly converted to all of our crews are picking at night. And it was started originally in the industry because, it, you know, we get these diurnal temperatures, we get this cooling at night. So we have these nice, cool grapes that are preserving that natural acidity as they get picked. Well, it turned out that the crews liked it better too. It's easier to pick at night. They can pick longer. The bees aren't out. Um, it really was a win-win situation. So I'd say 95% of what we bring in is picked by night or at night. Um, so you want to speak to the cooling tunnels? Yes. So um, we now we're picking so much at night. You know, the first couple loads are already super cold because it's so cold here at night in Sonoma County. Um, the first loads usually can um, are fine to go ahead, but we have these these tunnels here, which are really unique that we can put the grapes through uh, in the bin. So like a ton worth of grapes um, and they go through the tunnels and it cools the grapes down um, a couple, uh, about 10, 15 degrees. So we can go through the tunnels and then process the grapes where they're again being, the grapes being so cool that it preserves all those beautiful flavors. Um, you know, if the grapes are too warm, just like, you know, if you have fruit like an apple that's warm, it does not taste as good as when an apple that's cold or, you know, cooler. Um, so it's the same thing with the, when we we press the grapes to get the juice out, we want it to be nice and cool to retain all those beautiful flavors and aromas. So um, we have these unique cooling tunnels to do that. More questions? We do. We have another question about, can you talk about how you make the wine so consistent across all the shards? Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Um, the wine's a, re really a big part of what um, we do here as our winemaking team and the viticulture team is to have to make the wine as consistent as possible year after year. Um, so um, the other winemakers, um, Mick, who was introducing me, um, and then Zita and Nelia, we go at the beginning of harvest and we taste the grapes and we kind of, um, I guess you could say, calibrate our palates where we taste and um, say, okay, this is the right flavors this year at this kind of, we start getting, because every year mother nature is different, right? Every harvest is different. And so one year when the sugar's at this level, the flavor's at the right place, but another year the sugars might be a little bit lower and you have just as good flavors if you did another year higher sugar. So you almost need to go out every year and kind of taste together and say, yeah, here's the, the really great flavors and picking at the right time is really important because those are the flavors you're going to have for the rest of the time. So you have to pick at the right time. So the vineyards picking decisions are incredibly important, important to keep that consistency. Plus we have our process that, you know, we have similar barrel regime um, and, you know, we have the cooling tunnels and we have a lot of different things to keep the wines consistent year after year. Okay. Yep. No. Okay. Did you talk about the brie and how oh, yes. face with another one, cheese, <laughs> or go back and forth with the other two? Yes, thank you. you there? Um, so we have, I also have a brie on this plate. And the thing with brie's is they're so varied. They're just so different. Um, you can get some brie's that are kind of more earthy. 
Um, you can get breeze that are extremely creamy, um, some that are fairly mild or neutral. Um, and so the brie, depending on the brie you may have at your own house, would go with either wine. This brie right here, um, it's a local brie. And it's um, double cream because, well, if you're getting brie, why not get double cream? Go all the way. So it's a nice, <laughs> nice creamy brie. And this particular brie, because it's so um, rich and creamy, it actually goes better with the couture instead of the opposite leg here, we found, you know, just by tasting. And this is the fun thing that you can do at home with whatever foods or cheeses that you have. You try a little bit of this food and try it with one wine or the other wine. And then you try another one and you try it with the wines and see which one works. I mean, this is the scientific process, right? You got, <laughs> and um, <laughs> you have to have a couple bottles open, um, you know, like this soft goat cheese with rosé or Sauvignon Blanc, you know, Sonoma Couture Rosé and Sauvignon Blanc are just fabulous. It goes really, really well. Um, and that one's more of a, like having it with the Sonoma Couture Rosé is really crisp acidity and it goes with kind of the acidic goat cheese. Um, so it's kind of more similar things that are going better instead of kind of the opposites. So it's always fun to have those food epiphanies and just try it on your own. You never know what you're going to find. So we have another question okay. about um, going back to harvest timing and I think maybe consistency. But the question was, who makes the call on the harvesting and vinification decisions? Well, I mean, we work as a team here. So we've got, and, uh, we've got Mick director of winemaking that was here at the beginning. So he's generally out in the vineyards, um, but also Shannon's out there tasting. Um, I'm out there tasting, Zidanelli is out there tasting. Um, so, cause there's so many vineyards you have to kind of spread out um, to taste everything. So um, we make decisions as a team. And um, and the same thing with the process, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more in the winery during harvest time, making decisions on what's going on in the winery, but I'm always asking, um, you know, talk, you know, Mick and I are always tasting the wines and asking him his opinion and what we should do next. And so it's, um, it's just, just one person. It's a whole team. <laughs> so, yeah, I would add to that on the picking decisions. It's, I think we're very unique. The involvement we get from winemaking out in the field, um, they're out there every single day, every morning and coming back and we're talking about, you know, when it's ideal to pick. You know, so many wineries, they'll let the vineyard side kind of determine the picking date. Um, you know, really, it's always based on flavors and, you know, the numbers can be there. But if the flavors aren't quite there, we all agree we'll wait and pick it at the ideal time. Kara, there was a question that came from um, see, Catherine Birch. And do you have a favorite vintage? Is it different for the two different types of Chardonnays? <laughs> Ooh, favorite vintage. Well, you know, you know, kind of changes um, over time. So I might have a favorite vintage of wine, but it the wines kind of you know have a curve, right, where they improve and then they kind of you know fall down. So um, I mean, I always loved the um, 2003 Le Pierre because that was the first Le Pierre. I was started here in 05, but 03 Le Pierre is what we were selling at the time, and so it was just a beautiful wine and. It's the first time I got to have it so often. <laughs> so I really loved that wine. Um, so that one always brings back really great memories. Um, and then just recently I had a um, 15 Le Pierre that was drinking so beautifully. Um, my husband and I were up in Tahoe. And we just had a little salad and crab cake and we opened that wine and it was so perfect. It was such a joy to have, so again, like those food epiphanies and those great combinations. So kind of a follow-up to that mm -hmm. question was a question from Warren of, does the late here age well? <laughs> <laughs> I think you kind of answered it. Yeah. Had, what, 20, 25 year old late years. Yes. Gorgeous. Yes. So the late peers age beautifully. Of course, now aging, you need to age your wines um, properly. So that means um, consistent temperature, you know, around, uh, it's not hard and fast, but like 50, mm -hmm. 45 to 55 but the main thing is consistent and, and no light. Um, so, you know, I have a place underneath the stairs. It's nice and cool, but I also have a wine fridge um, to, to store the wine. So it's uh, it's important to store them properly. Lots of questions. Yeah, no, lots of questions through. popping up. Sorry, it's distracting. <laughs> I know. <You> see that. <laughs> so, another one from Pamela Duffy was, um, you know, I'm so proud to have two women in the wine industry. Did you think it was hard to break into? 
Um, I mean, it was, I don't think it was really hard to break into. I had a lot of really great mentors um, throughout the years. Um, you know, Dennis Martin and Terry Adams here and Nick Schroeder um, have all been really great and welcoming. And um, I always had the, I, I had a joke a while back that, um, you know, you go to a, a, a wine seminar, you know, uh, kind of like a viticulture and enology type seminar. And there's a line for the men's bathroom. There's no line for the women's bathroom. <laughs> um, so there's still um, there's still more men than women. But, you know, it's evening out more and more every day. Um, so it's not as much. I mean, the vineyards, having Shannon in the vineyard position um, is very unique. Um, she's actually in charge of all the vineyards, and she's the only female in the department. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so how about you? Do we have any response to that? Yeah, I, I don't find it hard to get into. I kind of just followed a passion and got into it. I did have the same realization as I started going to meetings when I was kind of early on in my career of looking around and going, oh, I'm in a room and I think maybe there's one other woman in here. Um, it's definitely changed over time. And I, I think maybe just learning to be confident, um, you know, and that came over many years and I think I've had a lot of opportunity to learn from really, really great people in the industry. So it's, it's been easy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> been pretty lucky. <laughs> what else is there on there? Well, a big question here Ooh. from Catherine Birch. So why did you make the decision to switch from cork to twist off? Can you age the wines as long? Oh, I love this question. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so um, absolutely love a twist off or screw cap. Um, it's the wine ages differently. So kind of some history cork is, you know, very traditional in the wine industry. Um, but there, since it is a natural product, it's hard to get it 100% um, uh, perfect, I guess. And there's always some, um, there can be some corks that have what we call cork, ta cork taint, which is a little kind of mushroomy, um, kind of that moldy basement type smell. And that ruins the wine. And so it's so un unfortunate. You can make this beautiful bottle of wine and then put a cork in it. And the cork, a small percentage, but still a percentage, can um, cause off flavors. So we've been slowly moving to screw cap. And actually, we've been doing a lot of experimentation here. Even before I came here, um, the previous winemaker had tested uh, screw cap in 99, our highest reserve wine, and um, tasted against cork. And the wines age differently, but they both age well. So um, we decided to um, start transitioning into screw cap for most most things here. Um, and so you can see our reserves are screw top. And so um, it's just a, a choice. And we're eventually going to go to um, almost all screw cap. So... Um, you mentioned our highest end wine, so that's our Founders Reserve, and we had a question from Jeff uh, about, can you talk a little bit about our Founders Reserve Chardonnay and what that program is about? Well, the Founders Reserve Chardonnay is really fun because it's the winemaker's favorite wine, <laughs> so we can make it out of anything that we find is our favorite from that year. So it could be this group of barrels, it could be a particular block from a particular vineyard, or it could be a blend of different blocks, um, it could be um, an, a natural yeast experiment. It can be anything. It can be so many things. So that's what our founders reserve. And we have that for Chardonnay and Pinot. Um, and it's the same thing for Pinot. We try different things and, you know, it's just the, the lot that we absolutely love the best. So. And another question. They just keep coming. So from <laughs> Joe Tamburello, um, how does Russian River Ranches and Sonoma Coast differ in uh, the grapes and the processing? Wow, someone knows our product. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if Russian River Ranch is what we generally uh, sell um, in restaurants. And, you know, just a little note here, you know, it's really great if you guys can support your local restaurants um, by, you know, getting, um, uh, ordering delivery or, you know, picking up at the door um, to support our restaurant industry. So, um, Thank you for that if you're doing it. Um, but our Russian River Ranches is for restaurants and our Cinema Coast is for retail. And we make it fairly similar style, but the difference is when we're blending, we pick the lots that are just a little bit more um, crisper that we know are gonna pair well with food. 
for the Russian River Ranches because we know people are going to have that with food. Where the Sonoma Coast, um, people buy that at their, uh, um, you know, their local market. And so they may have it as imperative. They might have it with food or they may not. So we make it a little bit less crisp. So it's a little easier to drink, a bit fuller and rounder. So um, that's kind of a easy difference between the two. We have a question about, have we ever thought about making a sparkling wine? <laughs> We've done more than think about it. We've done it. <laughs> uh, we made a limited um, sparkling wine as our winemaker release. We have a program where we make a special, unique wine um, every year. And so like one year it was the rosé and we love the rosé. We, we started making it all the time. We did our Sauvignon Blanc once where now it's a tasting room wine. Um, and so that's that sparkling wine. We did it one year and we aged it on the leaves and the bottle for three years and it got just really creamy and full and rich and absolutely beautiful. Um, so, um, and we're planning to make, uh, we have a sparkling rosé coming up soon too. Yeah. <laughs> we're interested yeah. in all of our different wines. So another question of will there be future releases of the late harvest Chardonnay? Uh, yes, we make the late harvest Chardonnay every couple years um, when the year is do so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that, that wine is really made in the vineyards. Um, you want to talk about that? Yeah. So with the late harvest Chardonnay, um, it's funny. We're looking for what we call botrytis. Um, so it's a, a mold that we typically try to keep out of the vineyards. But when you're looking for a late harvest and we get it at the right time and with the right humidity at the end of the season, it creates, um, you know, really nice kind of honey characteristics in the wine. And it's pretty unique that we make a late harvest out of Chardonnay, but we choose some of our more floral clones. So we have one planted um, at the vineyard just up the road that gives us kind of these orange muscat type notes. And mm -hmm. that along with kind of the honey um, kind of overlay that we get from the botrytized grapes uh, is just perfect for making kind of late harvest wines. But as Kara said, we don't get those conditions every year. Um, and we just kind of wait for the right time and then we make enough to last a few years. Yes. Well, it's liquid gold. It's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's it? That's okay, great. Fun. Well, yeah. yes. Great questions today. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everybody. Um, so some other things to just catch up on. Um, you know, we've done three of these. So this is the third in a series. Um, so if you didn't catch Mick or Zedonelias in the past, you can go back and rewatch those. Um, we're going to take a break next week and then we're going to start doing some more of these. Um, we'll be stay tuned for more details on that. Um, you know, and you can always check our website and our Facebook page for any new and upcoming information about Sonoma Couture. Um, I would add, I've seen questions about it come through kind of the comments, um, and, some answers, but just making sure everyone's aware that we have $99 shipping right now on, or sorry, not free shipping on oh orders <laughs> over $99. Um, so be sure to take you know, full advantage of that right now. Yeah. And that's going on until I think May 15th. Yep. So, so anyway, thank you all um, for, for tuning in today. Um, it's just, again, an honor and privilege to make this wine for you guys and that you, so many of you enjoy it. Um, it's just absolutely fabulous. So now sit back and enjoy, you know, the two different wines and maybe go and try them with other things around the house and see what you like to pair them with. All right. Thank you.